In the late 60s and early 70s, many of the cats who were playing improvisational music were trying to add on to the musical thesaurus that was John Coltrane. A spinning wheel of scales and rudiments played within different modalities, expanding consciousness and spirituality, and that people got to witness these performances live. Maybe it was a bar with nine people, but this music, the music of Train and Dizzy, Miles and Charlie Parker, affected every musician of the next generation. Rock players, blues players, Southern Dixie. You knew if you could or could not play that kind of music, but inherently the respect that was garnered across the board is a testament to the authenticity of these players. My guest today is one of the cats who borrowed from the masters and then added his own individual voice. For any pure jazz session, my guest got the call, playing with Roland Haynes and Joe Henderson, Herbie Lewis, the skipper Henry Franklin, Charlie Owens, Calvin Keyes, and Carl Burnett. But reading of names and record dates does not do justice to my guest. guest's playing, which comes through him. It is his ability to leave his physical body and transcend that allows the music to be spiritual. And like Randy Weston and Ellis Marsalis and Thelonious Monk, my guest was closer to the source of the music and was able to go farther back in the lineage to see where the music came from, how it was cultivated, and where it had changed. He played with the great yogi Rudolph Johnson and was smoking with Roy Brooks and the Chet Baker Quintet. <laughs> Kirk Lightsey, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. <laughs> Thank you for this wonderful welcome and very deep uh, introduction. Boy, oh boy. What is you know, Kirk, Feinberg? Feinberg is better. I I uh, I wanted to ask you if you could just talk about your uh, the, the neighborhood in Detroit and the kind of uh, experiential learning, like how you how you learned about music, because it's very different from the way people learn music today. I, I would love you to talk about your your street learning. Well, it was almost street, but not not exactly. Actually, I was for that time. I was a very uh, uh, a gift, well, uh, it was a very gifted time for me to be in a gifted city, Detroit, that was the main city almost of the world because of the automotive industry and because of the level of people that brought into the city and the level of, of culture that they were open to. And that's how we got in there. So, so I don't know, easily, maybe. But uh, <laughs> wait, the know. level of what do you mean? The level of culture? What can you can you can you unpack that? The level of culture now today, the sounds that they're forcing into our ears on on the media, yes. in the in the in the restaurants, everywhere you might go, you're forced to listen to this. Factory music, okay? Exactly. Now, I, exactly. I, I, when I was a child at uh, Trowbridge High School, which was on East Forest and St. Antoine or Hastings or between the, the two, we were taken sometimes on field trips. And one of the field trips was a trip to the Ford factory, the car factory, the manufacturer of automobiles. And the teacher of, uh, well, I don't want to make it negative, but Hitler got his ideas from Henry Ford. I didn't, I did not, I, I'm not even aware of that. <laughs> oh, how about that? Yeah. But it is true in, yeah. in, my, in my research and learning. But that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that right. it was Henry Ford's uh, acumen, his, his, his taking the city to such a high level that the people who were brought in to work here, green, red, brown people, with, with, with orange people, <laughs> all the people had to be on a very high level. Right. And the training was very in, in, uh, in depth, okay? I, intense? And, um, you were going to say intense, I thought. Oh, that too? Yeah. <laughs> You, you I mean, it. it was it was learning a trial by fire kind of stuff. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And 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 people who could uh, who could fit certain levels where, like, I had an uncle that was chosen to be the head of a certain part of the factory. He was the only black guy who, who was in that. Well, okay, in that part of the factory, and he was 
the only guy that could hold a position. Okay? <laughs> and all these, what, I don't know, four, 400 people or something, <laughs> and he was chosen to be in there. But at that time, there was great racism and all that stuff. I lived through two race riots, and I stayed alive, and my family was alive, but we saw it right in front of my windows. But the thing is, the city was on such a high level that the level of culture, the music that most people listen to, uh, there, was, there was a place for music on almost every corner. Uh, a Klein's, can you imagine a Klein's on every corner? A, a Bluebird Inn on, on all around Detroit and 12th Street and, and, and uh, well, Hastings Street and, and, and all around. There were many places to play music and everybody was working. So that led everyone to learn the music. But now the listeners now, this goes to the high level of culture. The listeners that were listening to our music, they would be there every night to check on you. And if you didn't know the bridge to a song, well, they probably knew it, and they didn't even play instruments. Uh, okay, yeah, they yeah. would tell you the bridge and tell you that they were going to kick your ass if you didn't learn it, <laughs> and if they heard you play it wrong again. Now this this is the level of intensive interest that we were brought up on in Detroit, and that's why uh, our level of of music and our playing and our grasp and our, we were pretty smart too. I mean, the level of culture was because of the level of mentality. Yeah, I mean, but you know, I, I've. It's so fascinating because I've talked, I've interviewed Kenny Burrell and, uh, you know, Donald Byrd was from there, Elvin was from there, Tommy Flanagan. I mean, I, I, I don't, Lightsey, and then there's this whole other, like, you know, Ranlin, like, Bell. I mean, I'm like, this is, was this just the entire, did everyone have their little sort of, like, their groups, but they all, you all swung together? I mean, I guess the point was that when I talked to some of the New York guys from the same time period, you know, the, your competition wasn't even your competition because there was so much work to go around. That, to me, is what, that's what made it the love. The love, and, and I'm trying to figure out that where the money was coming from. Like, did you play, how were the, your clubs supported? Was it through the mafia? Was it through business? I mean, Henry Ford was not supporting. Was he really into swing improvisation? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I, 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 I never got a message from him to say, oh, you played great the other night. <laughs> you know, here's a tip or something. No, not, not straight from him. But his ideas and his uh, led to this automobile industry level of push for tomorrow. And, all, and, and the first time in the world that, that, uh, was the line, the assembly line, where uh, things could be built. Uh, but the only thing was that you did this minuscule job of screwing in a screw four different ways and four different times, every time, two seconds away, all day. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> you had to be really smart to be depended on to do that. So it was a level that that took Detroit to a really great place to get off work and go and hear some music. Well, that kind of forced the people who didn't know that they were going to really be real musicians all their life <laughs> to uh, really right. practice, really That's learn it. the music, mm -hmm. really feel and, 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 and live the music. And Kenny Burrell was the teacher in the uh, uh, community music school on, what was it, on Force Between Brush and, and John R. Right down the street from, uh, oh, what was that club? The, 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 the client show? No, that was Yusuf. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, well, you said you know Yusef was another cat. Yusef was another Motor City. I mean, I mean, even I mean that I think someone said you know Ken, uh, Spider Kenneth Spider Rice, the drummer. I think he was a little bit younger than you. He uh, I didn't know him. He. Uh, right. He, he he played with he played with Chuck Rainey a lot, Studio Cat. But he just said there was a lot of Motown soul music in the in the jazz clubs too. That's what also uh, made, you know the soul uh, the soul made it very sophisticated in Detroit. Anyway, con- but continue on, continue. Well, I play. I was a part of the group that was chosen by by um, uh, Barry. Um, wow, Barry. Become the first band in in Motown in uh, what was it called Hitchville, USA. All right, mm-hmm. and Hitchville, USA was just the the name of the studio where we recorded the music. And uh, the the sound of Motown was James Jameson, right. who was a friend of mine. He would come to my house, we would play music, and he would, after, when it was time, he would go around the corner from my house and play with Washboard Willie at a little club right around the corner from me on 12th Street, and I lived on Gladstone, and he was just a half a block away at this club and played with Washboard Willie. Who was Washboard Willie? Who, what did he... What he did was he... the guy that played the Washboard. <laughs> And he sang, and he played a little, little uh, uh, harmonica. It's so freaking cool, yeah, man. It's yeah, so but, cool. But, but uh, right. that's where uh, 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 James Jameson's favorite gig was. But he was famous for being the Motown sound. Right. And when James Jameson uh, and Pistol Allen, who was the drummer, the first drummer for Motown, couldn't get the idea that they were after. And we had worked on it for a few hours and we still couldn't come up with it. They would go and get little Stevie Wonder to play the drums. Right. And in 10 minutes, uh, Stevie and and James Jameson would talk about it, throw it up in the air and come up with this fantastic thing. Wow. That would become the hit of Motown. And I, I'm on a few of the hits. <laughs> but they didn't name any. Right, it was, they didn't credit it. That's right. It's, 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 you know, I, I mean, we, yeah, no, I mean, I want to, I really want to ask, I mean, in my mind, like, you know, I, 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 I am part of the generation that is, you know, sort of, you know, coming to pass here where we, Everything is pre-programmed and sort of manipulated and played with and toyed with, and uh, it, it, there's no real sense of, I mean, the, the acousticity of music, the acoustic sense, the the swing in music, the rhythm in music has been comp- compressed and compacted, and you know, I it's so when I listen, when I heard, when I started this journey four years ago. And, you know, I, Skipper was like my fourth guest, you know. It really was just this idea of saying, when was the last time there was truly authentic American music being made? And the last time that was really being made was by Gene Russell. It was the black jazz, mm. it was the black jazz black label. Jazz. Black jazz. Well, we did that, me and the Skipper. And, I know, and you were everywhere on that, man. You were, you dominated. To me, that is legacy. That is so much legacy. And this, you're, I mean, I, you're talking to a guy, I didn't, I didn't come out of the womb till 78, you know, but I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this and being, young guy. yeah, you know, Some young guy. you know, that, but I mean, I'm looking for, I'm, I, I, everything is sort of, you don't have nearly the rec, the, the, rec, the industry is no longer, it's a business, it's a small business, you know, there, the offshoots and the opportunities for labels like Dick Shorey giving, you know, I did so much work, I have just been just to be reunited with a black jazz brethren like yourself is so unbelievably cool because that that label stood for real music. End of story. I mean, Gene Russell had his pulse exactly on the people who deserved to be recognized as pure American artists. Well, Gene Russell played the piano too. 
Not so good, though. <laughs> well, okay, but but he was on a couple of a couple of important. Uh, no, no, Gene. Uh, listen, my, Gene is a Gene's a dear. Gene was the catalyst. He, 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 it doesn't matter about his his technique or his ability or style. Okay, okay. <laughs> it, you know, it's like more like the understanding of uh, bringing in the sophisticated cats that that could really play. But yet, that that's the last time. I, I mean, there there really has been. It's it's hard to see a bridge for me. I mean, again, it's it, it, from your perspective. I'd love to get your perspective on where you were, you know, in the music, marinating in the music at that time, and and how things changed for, from then till now. Well, I was in L.A. I was see in the first part of my career. I was I became very good with playing for singers. I played. I was and. Because of my uh, my history, when Ron Carter and Paul Chambers and uh, and um, Keanu Zuwati, who was Bernard McKinney, and his sister and his uh, and so many so many great players who had been studying their instruments since they were five years old, like I had been studying piano, uh, were in high school, orchestra, and band. And they were at such a high level in Cast Tech, orchestra and band, and this all-city orchestra, and the there were several orchestras and band, others uh, that were kind of offshoots, and the Charles Young Post and the Elks Band, who were the first people who paid me for playing music, playing an instrument. Wow. Okay, in a marching band, in the parade, in the, what, the Christmas parade and all that stuff. Okay, that's the first pay I got for playing music on the clarinet. But I was a pianist. I had been studying the piano since I had asked for it, and they gave it to me, my mother gave it to me at five years old. I don't know what. Well, there was always a piano in the in in the house since I was born, so I just had to have it. <laughs> I guess because take I it. Just born. take it. Just take it. That's great. And and now when Barry, uh, Barry, Barry, I can't even think of his name. <laughs> Barry Gordy. Gordy, yeah, yes, Gordy. Yeah, yeah, and right. I was in love with his sister Anna. Yeah, right. And and she she chose <laughs> she chose Barbara Gay. <laughs> 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 oh my! Uh, oh, <laughs> I <dear>. wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> Light sees on fire. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but but oh, um, but it was okay because. Uh, he had chosen us, and we had our first chances in studios and under real, direct, uh, intense uh, performing under stress and under microphones and under, uh, you get paid when you make a take, all right? Now that became my major reason for leaving Motown. Because sometimes we would do it in two takes. Sometimes we would do it in 22 takes. Sometimes we would have two days of takes. And sometimes we would never take it, so we'd never get paid. But if you, if he took it, then you would get paid. It's just, okay? It was just too hit or miss. So you, but you, you, you played on, uh, which mo? Do you remember any of the Motown? Uh, I played. I played most of the Four Tops. Mostly all. Most all of the Four Tops recording. Wow, that is really oh, unbelievably God. revelatory stuff, right there. That's cool. Oh, okay, and I was with Aretha for only a couple of weeks. <laughs> I never played on a recording because the guitars was too loud. <laughs> Were you were you were you very uh, aware of uh, of her fa- C L Franklin her father? I went to his church. I would we would wow. there was a group of us oh, in the Evans yeah. the Amy Church on Brush and Superior I guess uh, just at Grace 
Hospital during that time, and I was living right across the street from Grace Hospital. And we went to that church. We would have a junior church, and we, which we were part of. And at a certain time, before the real church was over, we could get out of junior church and go over to Aretha's, over to Reverend Franklin's church, and hear Aretha sing, and the people shout and run around the church and whoop and pass out. And because the spirit had got from them, okay? Mm. And we were part of that. We would be a part of that every time we could sneak out of our own church mm. and go over to Clarence Franklin's church and, and hear Rita sing. And she was young like we were, you know. And that was a part of our learning, a part of our depth, a part of our, our mission. We would see how it could be done. Right. And and it it's all theater anyway. When you step on stage, it's theater. And not a lot of people know that today. But those who do, they take advantage of it. And they do everything that they can do to take the stage and to bring it to the people touchably and, and audibly and musically and every way of <laughs> I, I just, I, I, I'm... Every way of <laughs> Every way... Hey, when... Every when, way of <laughs> Can I ask you, did musically, you... Musically, touchably, <laughs> every way of <ably>. Every way of <laughs> <laughs> When did you, uh, when, I know, because w- one thing that warmed my heart, too, there's a lot of cats, you know, I never met most of you guys. Skipper, I've been lucky enough to go out, and he's just been such a conduit for me. But, I mean, but, like, a, a cat like Roy Brooks, I mean, the fact that you guys were the rhythm section for those classic prestige albums, how did that come about, and was that the first time you played with Roy? No, Roy and I grew up together mm. in Detroit. Where, okay. oh, beautiful, beautiful. And, and okay, I played with the great John Coltrane only once. Hmm. Please, wow, talk oh. about, please talk, talk about that. <laughs> okay, all right. Yusuf had this gig at, at the, uh, it, was, it was in a hotel out near Dearborn, where as a child we weren't allowed to go because that was segregated area. Uh, black people couldn't go there. But when, after a certain period of time, a black uh, creative artist, I think he was a, he was, he was a discoverer. Uh, he, I don't remember his name now. But he, 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 he was a, 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 a inventor. That's what he was. Right. And he invented several very important things. And with, he bought this hotel, and Yusuf got the gig there <laughs> after hours. When everybody was get off the gig, everybody was speed out to. Um, damn, I can't think of the name now. Uh, it'll come back. It'll come. It'll come the back. West, the, here it is, the West End Hotel. The West End. Okay. okay. The West End. Got it. West End Hotel, and it was. It was a week where Miles Davis came in town and he brought his new tenor player, uh, John Coltrane. And he had, he had Paul, he had, he had uh, uh, J.C., uh, Jimmy Cobb. Mm-hmm. And they came in town. And I was, I went to the concert, which was at a little theater that I had never been to on Grand Rue or somewhere near downtown. And... They were still in town because they were going to play. And they did. But we were expecting Miles to come out to, to hang out and be with, with, with Yusef. But Miles didn't come. But who was standing over my shoulder? Train. Looking at what I was playing. I looked around and it was John. That's awesome. So when we finished the song, he said, and, and Yusef had announced him, he said, into my ear what you want to play and I said after hearing what they had played I said Green Dolphin Street he said oh no 
What was yeah. second choice? What was your second choice? The blues, please. Yeah, right, yeah. Yusuf and John Coltrane just played the blues over an hour. It might have been an hour and a half, and they just burned it up. And I was playing for him, Roy Brooks and Bags' his brother. Jackson? Uh, huh? Bags' his brother? Bags' his Bags. brother? Bags' his brother. He has a brother. Oh, my God. I didn't know that. That plays the bass. What's Bags' his name? Milt Jackson. Milt Jackson. Well, this was... Uh, what's his name? Milt's so it was... No, it was, it was Jackson. It was Milt's brother, Roy, you, Train, and Yusef. Oh, yeah. man, dude, are you, what the heck? Look here, look here. That's the only time I ever played with Train. And I knew, and, and I'd grown up with, with Alice. And, and because Alice was with John, I, we all became friends. And I never played with him again, but I didn't need to. That was McCoy. Shit, that was, oh, man. And, uh, wow, yeah. that was, uh, and that was after Motown. <laughs> That's just, to me, it's just, it, um, you know, you play with him one time. What, what separated him? Uh, and why, you know, why did everybody, uh, I, I don't know if this, who was, I'm trying to think, I've, you know, I've done a bunch of interviews lately, but, uh. You know, Stanley Clark. Stanley Clark, I mean, he's young. I mean, he just basically was saying, you know, in, the, in this early 70s period, they were trying to emulate Coltrane. And I'm just trying to get to that source. I'm trying to get to the to, as close to the source as possible, Kirk, because, you know, it's like, it, it, you, the you know, generations are getting farther and farther away from it. You don't always have, you know. You you guys didn't take it for granted. Believe me, you guys played your asses off and had a ball and did your thing. But yeah. you know, it's dried up, man. You know, and like it, it, you know, like that spiritual. You were right in it, man. Every guy you played with was somebody who let themselves go for to, from their physical being, and that is spiritual, and that's not part of our you know it's not part of the context of our religiosity in this country and i think it, you know that, that that that's spiritualism just as any much as anything else is that kind of well thing? you're talking about spiritualism and it, it wasn't church or no, anything no specific. it was spiritual from the cosmos from the highest point of the light that we're all trying to get to mm. that train and yusuf played the blues for an hour and a half. <laughs> okay, yeah. and everybody was I mean out they were they were being blessed. They were they were in, in prayer. They were and it was jam packed, this place. And they played the blues. And I was and Ron was and <laughs> we were playing the blues with them. It was as some of the young people say, awesome. Yeah. That's right. It's awesome. Yes, indeed. And Brooks, and you and Roy, I mean, because that guy, um, like, were you, were, did you stay in touch with him all the way through his life? Who, John? No, no, Roy. Roy Brooks. Roy Brooks. Yeah. We've always been in touch. We're still in touch. All right, of course okay. you. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> I love you. I love Kirk Lightsey, too. This <laughs> No, Brooks was like Brooks was an inventor though. He like made saws and he had like yes. all this crazy stuff. I I just to me it was the inventiveness was um yeah, you know, there wasn't as much materialism around. So you guys had more time and I I'm sure with you when I interview guys like Joe Sample and other cats they're just like you say beautiful man and he's like you know I just started calling it every night in the clubs you know what what what's the dog du jour tonight that I'm gonna what kind of ivory am I gonna have tonight you know what kind of bad piano you know and, and hearing stories from 
Junie Booth about McCoy banging a piano back into tune. You know, it just it. it <laughs> <laughs> Junie said that he did. He, I, I, you know, I, I, if I get your email, I'll send you uh, some of the interviews. You'll crack up hearing some of these stories, man. Because oh, well, my email, yeah. my email is easy. Uh, no, we can I, no, but uh, yeah, we can do it after the interview. I'll get it. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. But but okay. yeah, you know, I mean. Um, so, the 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 gist of it was, uh, how did the Chet Baker sessions come to be? Oh, okay. Um, okay, George Coleman. Well, okay, maybe I'll start with uh, Melville Liston. Mm-hmm. Okay, when I was still in Detroit, and I had gone out, I had gone to New York for a couple of weeks or something. I'd been to several places playing music. And going back to Detroit. And uh, I think I was out of the army then. I'm not sure. I have to get the dates together. My book will have it all in there. Of course. But but, but uh, I went into, into the Bluebird Inn one night. And, I mean, the name Melba Liston didn't mean that much to me at that time. And all her girl band. Didn't they? They didn't pop out at me because I was in Detroit. Sure, but but in in New York, they were the women of jazz. Uh, Gloria Coleman was uh, she married George Coleman, and actually their house was my first uh, place to live in New York City, and on Twenty Seventh Street. West 27th Street and 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 uh, Broadway, no, and 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 Seventh Avenue, and that's up to 127th, and it was near Smalls, it was near, it was near, uh, uh, um, oh, okay, Chicken and Waffles, and it was a bunch of stuff. Yeah, Blue Mitchell, Blue Mitchell would play at that Chicken and Waffles house. <laughs> Mapenzi, Mapenzi is one of the best. I, I, Mapenzi is one of the greatest albums of all time. Oh, boy, oh boy. Smoker, man. You guys, I mean, it just it, it, you. You know, it's. It, I feel com- I feel comfortable being me with with you with you guys, man. It's it's a it's a good it's a good solid. Uh, I mean, it's a good vibe. It's a good vibe. You know. But a lot of the cat, I mean, like you said, so, I mean, let's step back for a minute. Uh, well, I mean, we, we're jumping all over the place here. So, you're, you're, Melba Liston, she wowed you that night? She blew you off, the, she blew you out of the club? Well, when I came to the club that night, her pianist, uh, who was a girl also, was in the hospital that day having her baby. <laughs> so, they didn't have a pianist. So they were playing the gig that night without a piano. So Clarence at at the Bluebird Inn, uh, as soon as I came to the door, he rushed me to the stage <laughs> to play with Ralph Lister and Gloria Coleman and and William Barton was a saxophone player and and Paula Roberts was a drummer. And uh, when we finished, and it was really good. Melba says, you want to go to New York? <laughs> okay, so for us, wow. I mean, it was, that was that was the goal, to go to New York from Detroit with a gig. Very important. Okay? Joe Innocent did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. And now, it was, <laughs> I said, please, what are you losing? She said, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Well, it was like, Three thirty then in the morning. <laughs> wow! Wow! But I you're like I got to go back to you're like I got to go back to my apartment, get my get my bags, and come back. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you see? Oh man, I just cause I get can... into all of that. Yeah. And uh, but I made I made it, and that was my beginning in the big time. In the big, I love it. We're just, I mean, dude, we. we we're 40 minutes in. We've just started. You know, it's like this. Is <laughs> <laughs> you might have to call me again. <laughs> no, we're doing a, we're doing part two. We're not getting through the whole thing tonight. But but <laughs> okay. You no, know, but 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 so you so you you uh, 
you, uh, I'm still trying to, this, you guys were the, why did they, who set up the idea of, of you, of you guys as a rhythm section with, with Chet Baker when you got to New York? Uh, okay. I had stayed with, with George and Roy Brooks and I had grown up together and, and, and Bulldog, who was, uh, uh, the bass player, uh, yeah, no, I can't either. Actually, it's bumming me out right now. Well, I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah. Because he was, he was, he, we grew up from a certain point with him too. Uh, no, it was a, it was the rhythm section for Chet Baker for that those albums. Yeah. I mean, that, that I mean, was some of the most smoking that, stuff in the world. That was a rhythm section that had played together in Detroit when we were there, and and that's Roy. Actually, okay, let me let me cite it. Yeah. I was conducting and playing the piano, from the piano, with Demita Joe at the time. I was with her for about five years. Wow. Our, our drummer uh, uh, had had an accident. When I gave the downbeat, he fell off the back of the stage. And the stage was very tall, very high. In New York, I had a hotel next to... Uh, Grand Central Station. Um, I can't remember. It, it might have been a. I can't remember the name of the hotel now. But uh, uh, he, uh, Jimmy Duncan was his name. Jimmy Duncan. Jimmy Duncan, and he was from. Uh, wow. Well, uh, I'll tell you later. It, uh, near <laughs> Chicago. Right. Right. But, but you, so you, you, Mel Balliston was like, you want to come to New York, and Roy, was, was Roy already there, or was he in, still in Detroit, or he, you guys go together? No, Roy went there, actually, and stayed there before I did. He did, okay. So he was already yeah, there. Yeah, he was staying with Horace Silver and, and a lot of people. Hmm. But I had uh, hung out in Detroit. I had gone... Uh, now, I didn't tell you this, that, that while in Motown, uh, there were the four tops, plus four, who went to Vegas for three months. And the plus four was Rod Brooks. Clarence Shell was a bass player. He was a, a, a great bass player, Red. He, was, he played with the Windsor Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. But he played gigs with us in Detroit. And... And Joe Henderson. Wow. And me. Okay? And Whoa. we were with the four tops from, from, from Motown. Oh, my for God. For three months in, in Las Vegas. <laughs> and, and that kind of started this whole thing rolling. And, wow. and Roy and I kind of were, we, wherever we were in the world, uh, when there was a special event happening for either one of us, it was somehow call the other one to the other one, and we would be together on a special event, of event for him or for me. That's really and we wouldn't we wouldn't actually uh, plan it. It would just happen. It was magical somehow, and this was one of those. Roy and I were playing together in 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 uh, in, in uh, what? What am I saying? Atlantic City. In, Atlantic City. In Atlantic City. With, with Demita Joe. And Roy told me uh, one night, he said, we got a date. We got a record date with, with, with uh, these people. And, and four, uh, who were we recording for? Uh, anyway, he told me about this date. I said, no, shit. 
wasn't Bags' brother. Right? No, 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 no. Herman no, Wright was no. the... Herman Wright was... Thank you. That's the rhythm section for Chet Baker, for smoking yes, and coming on. Uh, yeah. You guys... The, there's... I, I just... Uh, the thought process there, I'm still... Um, so, I'm, I guess Roy got the... Can, he hooked you guys up for that? I mean, how did that... Well, they hooked Roy up. Yeah. And Roy hooked us up. Okay, and that's the way it came Two out. Two hours sleep, on the bus, breakfast, sleeping under the piano till people ro- till Chet Baker rolled in. Yeah, oh. yeah, and George and, 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 I, I mean, I, dude, I want to go back a little bit farther for a minute. I mean, this is so special. Like, you, you and Joe Henderson mm. were, were playing the, with the Four Tops? Yes. I mean, the four thousand for three months in Las Vegas. That was at the Dunes. The Dunes doesn't exist anymore. But the Dunes then was one of the main hotels in, in, in Vegas. And we went there for three months, and we were playing in the lounge. Well, there was a big show in the other room, the big room, with, with showgirls and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you. you yeah, we were young, yeah. young <laughs> things. <laughs> I mean, it's just it, to me. This is like this is absolutely like uh, this is some of the most captivating stuff of all time. Just the idea that you had no idea where you guys were headed. You were just trying- uh, we, nobody knew who they were at that time. We knew who we were at then. I mean, we didn't know where we could go with this stuff. Well, if People would ask us, well, what do you do? We say, we play music. They say, but what do you really do? Okay? And we would say, shit, what do I have to do to really do something with music? I mean, that's, yeah, yeah what do you really do? I mean, it's just... Um, okay. We, we didn't know. We didn't have a clue that we were going to stay in this stuff all our lives. That we were going to really gain a, 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 a real... Lifetime in music and in special music, and be, I don't know, pretty good at what we did, or very good, like Joe Henderson. And Joe Henderson, it was was Joe Henderson and Albert Irons and me. We were a trio in Detroit that were everlasting. And we, when you saw one, you saw the other two. (laughs) We were like that. And, uh, well, that's the way it was. And Joe is still my friend. What? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 you know, tell me a little bit about, um, uh, I, I, I caught a picture of you on Facebook. Santa Fu Hall put it up. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, but I'm curious about right now, um, your, the level of live playing that you're doing in where where you're living now and, and the kind of satisfaction, if you're having some good satisfaction playing music right now? Actually, I am. Um, my favorite club in Paris is a club that I've been playing in for 30 more years with Dexter, with a lot of people, even with Chet. And in, in the... In, in the uh, a new morning in Paris, and it still exists. It's still a great club, and it holds more people than any other club in Paris. And it's a great venue, and it's run by great people still from the source that is started. Okay, I've, we've been playing there for 50, 40, 
50 years. I don't know how many. Right. But, but it's still my favorite club. The new, the new morning. Now, the next club is the, the, uh, Duke, the Lombard. Well, we liked it. I don't know. It's, it, we liked it better when it was the old Duke of Lombard. Because it had a different atmosphere, ambiance, a, a feeling of friendliness, and it had space. Right. That people could stand around, they could stand up, people could be seated and still see the bandstand and, and hear very well. And it was a big place. People could, could sit on the steps behind the bandstand and hear the music and see it. People could stand around the bar, and it was just an amazing place that felt kind of like Bradley's in Paris. But And that was the favorite place of Paris for me. Now, uh, and it was owned by a wonderful guy named DDA. But they, decide, they decided to change it. And another guy bought it, and he put a lot of money into changing it. But they took the space out of uh, the Duke. And now it's, it's an elegant space, kind of. They have pretty good food, but once you're seated, you can't move. You're stuck right there, and we're stuck on the stage. Yeah, it's because it's very conf- it's upstairs, confining. Yeah, it's very confining. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. When the when the waitress is going to collect the money just before the set is over. <laughs> okay. And the set ends, then it's a traffic jam, and nobody can move. They have to let them out, people by person by person. <laughs> it's crazy, but it's it's still a great club. It's run very well. Okay, now mm-hmm. there's the sunset, sunside, which for intense jazz lovers from from the deep the depth of the jazz clubs, they like the um, uh, sunside because it's small, it's intense, and the sound and the instruments are really good. But you have to squeeze in there too. But it's like more kind of old style feeling. Yeah, visceral, yeah. And, you know, than, than before, than, than the other one. There's some other ones around. Uh, clubs for music, for jazz, that some hotel play the music. Some, uh, there's some special places in Paris and outside on the perimeter and in other places. And when you're really in the Paris festival, you play at La Villette, which uh, I just played at, uh, what, a month ago, I guess. And, and uh, I guess a year, the year before, with Stefan Belmondo, who's a great French trumpet player. Wow. And he sounds like he's in the family of the Belmondo, that's the French actor, uh, and big actor in the movies. But I don't know about that. I don't think he is. But uh, we still keep keep hitting. We keep playing. We keep wishing for magical music to come out of our instruments. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Sometimes it really does. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, that's it's it, the it, God. It gets reinforced every time that happens too, and it's it's mm-hmm. such, such a great uh, feeling. You know, it's just such a, a beautiful feeling. I and I um so tell me a little bit. I I I'm fading a little bit here, and I want to let you. Okay. I want to let you rest a little. Bit. I would love to do. What's your itinerary for the next couple of days? Are you? We can talk again. We can talk again. No problem. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. Maybe I'll. I love, it. I love your direction, your, your intensity, and your interest, and your heart. Thank okay. you. Thank you, my brother. So, anytime you want to talk to me, you're cool. 
<laughs> right on, man. Right on, man. At some point, I might interview you. <laughs> it was. <laughs> no, I, you know, you know, you tapped into the right source when you know you when you know you're there. You're you know when you get there. You know. <laughs> Yes, indeed. All right, man. Herbie said that. Herbie said that. You know it when you get there. Exactly. Herbie said that. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. All right, oh, Lights. Yeah, listen, tell this, give Skipper a hug. I'll, I'll, call, I'll call you tomorrow, man. Okay. All right, okay. now. Ciao. Um, if yeah. you don't get me tomorrow, call me the next day. Uh, uh, what's tomorrow? What's tomorrow? Tomorrow's, tomorrow's Wednesday. I'll call you Thursday. Okay. All right. That, that'll probably be more effective. Because tomorrow is, I think, a busy day. It's a rehearsal day for, for, for Henry, and I'm going with him to the rehearsal. And because it's central in in L.A., a bunch of people are going to meet me there. <laughs> Listen, go, go, go have a good time. Go have a good time, man. Seriously. Okay. All right, man. Okay. I'll talk to you Thursday. Feinberg. Feinberg, baby. Feinberg. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, Lightsy. Let, keep you. dwelling, man. Thank keep you. dwelling, man. Thank Peace. You. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. Mercy. Mercy. This is fine, bird. Fine. Back it up. Un- <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> hey, can I turn the phone up a bit? The volume of it? Does it go up anymore? <laughs> hey, fine, bird. How you doing? I'm fine, man. We just fine. I'm fine, bird. Oh, you're fine. That's, so, I mean, we're rolling, man. You're finer than fine. I poured a drink for the occasion, too. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, I'm here with my, my, my old friend, Leon Williams from Detroit. Wow. Oakland, California. Plays the saxophone. I'm here with James Benson. And he plays the alto saxophone. And we're here with Roderick Keeler, who is one of my oldest friends. Wow. <laughs> he looks at you. <laughs> <laughs> and he used to be a great clarinet player. Uh, but he gave that shit up a long time ago. <laughs> this is a throwback, man. I mean, when was the last time you played with these cats? Detroit. Now, how long ago was that? Oh, my God. That was, boy, oh boy. 50, 40 oh years? God. You think it's 40 years? It's probably more than 40. Uh, more I'm than so 40 years psyched. Ago. I'm so psyched, man. I'm so happy. Leon, Leon, was it 40 years ago that we had the, the heavy dippers? The heavy dippers. <laughs> we had a... <laughs> we had, in Detroit, we had a band called the Heavy Dippers. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> well, it was Donald Town. Robert Friday was a bass player, and who who else was in there? And me. <laughs> yeah. You got you got any ta- you got any tapes of that of that band? Uh, do we have any tapes of that <laughs> band? You got any, Leon? Well, down 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 downtown had some, but he's the oh he left it years and years ago. He left it years and years ago. Hey, uh, hey, uh, Lightsy. No. Hey. Hey, uh, yeah. w- when was the last time, uh, did, when was the last time you ever connected with Roland Haynes? Oh, you know Roland Haynes? I've been trying to find this guy. Yeah, man, because you guys played double keyboards on that second coming album with the Skipper and Burnett. Which mm-hmm. Most- mm-hmm. Unbe- so I was like, I wasn't sure if you would. I mean, I'd love to know where that cat is. Skipper said he was a dentist or something. Uh, no, he's he's actually an eyeglass specialist. That's what I meant. Okay. His, his right. father, his father was in the in the eyeglass business. He was an oculus. He fitted glasses and that kind of thing. And uh, and and uh, he lived in uh, what can I call it? Southwest. Canada, he, uh, right. like above, uh, what, up, 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 up the west coast. Like Montana? Like where? Like Montana, or even... No, like Canada. Uh, like, yeah, I know, but like north of that, or, or, or like more north, north of... of? North of, Mont- 
Santa, I guess. The north of Seattle, north. yeah, up in Canada. Seattle, up there, straight up. Uh-huh. And, and uh, he's up in that. And I've just been trying to get in touch with him for years, but I haven't been able to, to run him down. But maybe you can. Well, I've, I've stretched it pretty far. I was going to ask you, do you remember anything from that session at all, Second Coming? Uh, from the session? That was Rudolph Johnson? No, no, no. It was it was Roland Haynes. He was the leader. Oh, and two pianos. Two pianos. Oh, shit. Yeah, Kirk uh, Lightsey, Lightsey right. playing this, like, isotopic stuff. I've never heard anything like it in my life. Playing. You I were playing that. And Haynes was, yeah, no, it was a double keyboard skipper Burnett. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I, oh, you, and that was the whole album? Second Coming. It is the most ferocious, very hard to find on vinyl. I think there's probably, you could, I mean, it is a razor's edge album. Like You are all over the shit, man. Can you send me a copy of that? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I don't even have a copy myself. The skipper. Well, he was on it. The Skipper definitely has a copy in his collection. Okay. Maybe. But you should see his collection. <laughs> I mean, for him to find that, he would need this whole house of people looking for it. No, I, I, dig, I dig through that in 20 seconds. He, he, he won't let oh, me. Oh, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. You just look under H. It's categorized. It's, it's <laughs> alphabetized. <laughs> well, you should see his. <laughs> Maybe he knows, I'm sure he knows much more than I do about his collection. Kirk, you know, it's just just such beautiful music. I encourage you to go back and listen to it. It'll be inspiring for you. Do you remember the second coming? The record, we made two pianos with Roland Haynes and who else? And Burnett. And Carl Burnett. Yeah. Right. And do you have a copy of that? The recording? You don't know. He does. He does. Uh Oh, he says yeah, Brian Burke says you know, <laughs> but he don't have a copy. No, I, 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 I uh, no. He must know if you have a copy. Well, he thinks he does. <laughs> okay, well, he says he does. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is a wild house today. I'll tell you. I, I mean, are you? Do you feel like you're gonna? You can sit, settle in for an interview. Or you want to? You, are you just having a ball? I don't want to take you away from your, your buddies. You know. Oh shit! This is his shoulder, and uh, sometimes I have to relax it before it acts right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bitch getting old. Yeah, no, it's all good. You're not old yet. We're just getting there. No, I mean, I'm not. I'm really trying to, like, just push back, man. Stay young. <laughs> trying to stay young, man. <laughs> oh, my. Okay, what, what do you think? I got all these guys here. And, and, and it's kind of a... Uh, impolite. I guess I didn't know that it was kind of <laughs> Yeah, no, go, 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 go play music, man. Like, call me, call me tomorrow. If you want to do it, we can do it tomorrow night or something. Okay, well, what do you do in the daytime? Because it might be even better then. I'm actually interviewing Randy Weston on my radio show. Oh, what did you tell him that was for me? Well, can you tell me a quick Randy? Do you know Randy? You, you, met, you know him? Yes, of course. He was the first guy I met when I walked through the airport, uh, Kennedy, with the Melba Liston all girl band uh, wow. to, to hit at the uh, small paradise uh, with Melba Liston and the all girl band. And I was there because her piano player had just had a baby in Detroit. And I went there on the last night, and the owner pushed me up on the piano, and Melba says, You want to go to New York? And I said, where? She said, <laughs> 9 o'clock in the morning. That's it was right. 3.30 then. <laughs> but I made it. And and Randy Weston probably was the first guy that I met in New York City at the airport. Because now the Weston and Randy were very good friends. 
did, did, uh, you know, what's cool is that he's they're doing a tribute to Melba Liston uh, at the in New York, and I, I I will the first thing after my monologue, like I did with you the other night, after my monologue, I will tell him that I spoke to you and and you told me you told me the story in our in our first interview that you guys played with her, the piano player had the baby, and mm-hmm. she, she's like, you ro- you know, we're rolling out early in the morning, you got about four hours of sleep, and you're gone. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, humor me, Lightsey, before you get out of here. Um, I, I, there, there's a guy that uh, has sort of been pushing me along on this journey the whole time, uh, and you played with him a lot, but uh, uh, Rudolph Johnson. Yes, indeed. Uh, he and I were in the army together. Really? So we were in the army in Fort Knox from One fifty eight colored band. Our army band. Army band. Army band. It was. It was at that time. It had been. It had. It was deseg- The army desegregated. Uh, uh, <laughs> Not really. But there, it was pretty cool, especially in the band. I'm just. Tr- I mean. I mean. What? So you guys are writing original tunes like that is a powerhouse band. I mean that is. I mean, I gotta tell you something about Rudolph, man. Like, I mean, I, that dude. You guys were creating before I was even born, but I mean, the sh- the stuff you guys were 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 creating. It was so so wide open, man. It was so outside. It was so open, and it and it got through. It found a way to the surface, and now you got. I'm just wondering when Rudolph got serious about uh, you know uh, uh, his, his uh, being a yogi, you know, being being uh, you know. <sighs> Doing a lot of meditation. Was he like that always? Was he in the army? Because I mean, I, I. No, not in the army. Actually, <laughs> this uh, this got him out of his state that he was living in the army. He was in trouble all the time. So we seriously forced him to straighten up. <laughs> That's what he thought about that. Yeah, that's not, you're not gonna make a lot of friends that quickly. That's so great. The band is broke up. The music was left. We lost it. We almost kept buying it. Oh my god! It's so many stories. Man. What about what about Habiba? Habiba was a girlfriend of mine. And I'm trying to find her right now, but I don't. I don't remember her last name. No, but it, wait, wait, wait a minute. What about what about the, the going to? Didn't you go to Africa and cut this album with Rudolph? Oh yeah, it was a big band. It was Hal Man, Blue Mitchell, and oh, it was such a big. It was uh, oh, Doug Side was on there one or two years. Steve Galloway, oh, lots and lots of players, but we went there to join Lovelace Watkins, who was a singer, and he sang like Paul Robeson, and uh, he uh, he became very important in quite a few places, like Australia and England. He lived in England. What was his name? And in Vegas. What was his name? Lovelace. Watkins. Lovelace Watkins. And he was more of like a social ju- justice folk singer kind of person? Well, he sang, he was kind of like, like Paul Robeson. Right, he right, right. He had a voice and all of that. And he sang really good uh, show songs and songs from uh, Broadway shows and hits and that. And one of his big songs was, uh, uh, my brother, no, uh, he ain't heavy. He's mm-hmm. my brother. Oh, that was him? Yeah. Wow. That was, he was 
one of the guys that did that. Wow. Uh, yeah. Well, Donny Hathaway did one that was so ridiculous. Oh, yeah, yeah. the other guy did that song, but... Yeah. This is, this well, they one. sent they sent that band they sent a bunch of maniacs with that they sent all you cats over there with him. Uh, yeah, they sent it. Well, the first band was with um uh, oh, 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 Monk Montgomery Monk Montgomery. Monk. Well, yeah, one of my uns. Dude, I, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. He was the first cat to use the electric bass on on, a, on an album. Right. Is that is that is that true? I mean, that's what I've heard. I didn't hear that. Do oh. say it again. I didn't hear it. Sorry. Monk Mon- It's okay. Monk Montgomery was the first cat to use the electric bass on a album. Not saying that the electric bass wasn't used before. First time the ele- uh, first time electric bass showed up on an album was 1953. Art Farmer. Monk Montgomery electric okay. electric bass. That's probably true. Yeah, that's I'd, probably very true. Okay, so uh, so and how and how I you know the other guy that I interviewed way back when was Horace C. Arnold. You cats played mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, the my man, dude. Right, he's a friend of mine. Uh, and he way back in the army, he talked about you guys playing in the in the in the army together. <laughs> he was because he was around there. He was trying to get in there as we all were. That's so he, awesome. Because I don't know. We all learned to play together, and uh, that's where we that's where we learned it. When did when did Rudolph become a yogi, though? Uh, not long after he came out of the army, and we were in the army together. Let's see, he came out a little later than I did. Cecil and I, Cecil came out a half a year earlier. I came out, and then Rudolph came out maybe half a year later than me. So it was, uh, he, he discovered, when he came out of the army, somehow, he discovered uh, Yogananda. Mm-hmm. And I had been studying yoga, yoga too, and I still do. But uh, Rudolph took it at first, because he was on this, uh, I don't know, I, I, I almost call it a clean-up kind of uh, um, uh, uh, mission of himself for something. He was, he was, well, he found this uh, yoga, um, and he started to practice it then. That must have been, what, we were there from 60 to 60. So, uh, how did he t- tell me? Tell me, tell me? Tell me how he took it a step further. How did he take it a step further? He took uh, because he went into this uh, uh, Yogananda uh, kind of uh, society, and he became one of one of their. Uh, uh, I don't know how to say this. Uh, regular followers. And, right. Uh, right. You know, and he really went in there. He was there every time. And he and his wife uh, were very serious about uh, Yoga Nanda and, and uh, that whole situation, that whole uh, study, religious, whatever you want to call that, uh, that society. It was a and society. He was there when he, wow. Yeah, wow. it was Yogananda and uh, this Indian uh, yogic uh, experience. And you were making these incredible, al- at the time, I mean, I got to get you this, mu- have you listened to those albums you've made with him? Uh, not, no, not lately. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want you to, I honestly... I, I, uh, Lightsey, I want you to listen to these albums, man, because the, uh, they're the most inspirational albums I've ever... I mean, I, this stuff that you guys were... I just wonder in those sessions... I mean, you didn't do... You didn't... You weren't like what I... You know, you weren't like a studio... Uh, for lack of a better word, you weren't all over the place, you know? You weren't... You, you didn't play... Uh, you weren't a, uh, an accompanist that you would find on certain labels up and down the coast, but the albums that you did play on 
were really heady stone afro jazz gigs. You know, I mean that's the that's the, that's the truth, man. What did you what did you do? I mean, were you playing in the 70s? Did you did you support yourself uh, just by playing in a band and traveling the country. What else? Because I mean, you were not. Oh, yeah. I was after after I stopped having shoes, and I was right out of high school. And I was uh, well, it was somewhere in there that um, well, it, it, there was a feeling in uh, if you were working a working musician, that was a different feeling. Then, if you were just playing gigs mm-hmm. uh, now and then, and you had a, a regular day job, okay. Now, if you had a day job in Detroit and you were supposed to be a musician, well, you weren't all the way in there. Mm-hmm. You hadn't you hadn't decided you hadn't uh, dedicated yourself to to um, life, music, life or death. <laughs> okay, <laughs> kind of <silly. laughs> and uh, well, with the people who came into my uh, surrounding, um, they took me there. They took me to this playing music. I stopped selling shoes. I stopped selling everything. <laughs> 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 we, nobody knew who, who we were. Or we didn't know who we were. But we knew that we didn't want to work at Ford, so didn't want to do uh, anything else but play music. And that's what we did. And it worked out somehow. Yeah, I mean... I told you that people used to ask us, uh, well, what do you do? We said, I, I would say, I play music. I said, oh, no, but what do you really do? Uh, I, I mean, oh, God. Okay? So, uh... Um, we had to answer that question somehow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 uh, it's funny. I I uh, I interviewed Booker T. Jones today, and I just was like, uh, you know, uh, he's always just he just said, you know, I've always just tried to adhere to making really good music. Uh, I don't try to do anything commercial. Um, I think I know how to do something commercial, but it never turns out good. I just try to adhere to the music directly, you know, just, and, and I just wanted to, and I just wanted to ask you kind of like over the last couple of days, if you can talk about, you know, obviously you can't coming back to California to reconnect with, with old brothers, but I mean, how has the music felt for you? And, and, uh, and, uh, just take me through that if you would. Okay. I'll, I'll do it as well as I can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it all depends on when you catch me. Um, and the cafe and the question, yeah. <laughs> I have a good time, but I'm okay. I'm, I'm, uh, you can ask me anything. <laughs> and I'll tell you as truthfully as I can remember. <laughs> No, I mean, no, I want to know. I mean, how you guys been playing music at the Skipper's house the last couple of days? Uh, yeah, we rehearsed uh, what yesterday, the day before, and Skipper and I we play when we feel it. We just say okay, and we, you know, but at his house, I mean, we can play any time, day or night or morning or afternoon. We can just we just sit down and just. <laughs> and it don't matter because he's got uh, he's got a property that is uh, kind of big yeah, well, I, this place is pretty class. That place is amazingly classy. You've been there. I've I've been there like three, four times. I, I've slept. Oh, well, great. You yeah, know what I'm yeah, it's okay. it's wonderful. It's wonderful. So, so we just uh, we we trying to trying to get his pool table back together so we can shoot pool and play music at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'll let you. I'll let you go back to your go back to your friends, man. Like let's try. Okay, so when are we gonna talk? Uh. I mean, it's kind of like I I could do it, uh, I, but I mean the nights for you are not so good, right? Well, tomorrow I might be. Uh, 
be in the city. Yeah. All right. I mean, well, how how what's your itinerary? How long are you in the state? Are you, are you uh, you're still living in Europe, right? Yeah, I live in Paris. In Paris, really? okay, but Paris. I'll be I'll be in the states until the twenty maybe. Oh, that's brilliant! You got a few weeks here, man. Well, I'll uh, I got another week here, and then I'll try to go through North Carolina, talk to my uh, editor. No, well, yeah, she's my my typing editor. Right. <laughs> Mesro. No, actually, I saw you in a clip. Re- Did you play recently with Gary Bartz? Yes. Oh, I saw that clip. It was boisterous, man. That's awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy so much, man. I love, I love that cat. I- Hey, one more. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say. I, did you? Did you hang? Did you ever get cross paths with Charles Lloyd? seen him in the past couple of years at the, well, at the, at the Holiday Inn at La Villette. That's where most of the guys stayed on it. But I mean, did, were you, did you cross paths with him when you were down in Southern California? Uh, no, not down there, but this was in Paris. But I mean, like back maybe in the 60s or 70s. Oh, we played together with Roland Hand. What? Yes, of course. And, and Sunship. Wait. A yeah, we played with 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 him in small clubs in Santa Barbara and shit. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> that's where I, I met him. Do you know? Oh, yeah. oh, but okay, but do you know how obsessed sunship, I'm obsessed right? with Sunship, man? I'm obsessed with that guy, man. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, you, you knew Ship? Yes, I mean we played with Sunship. So you're talking about double keyboards, drums, and horn? Say it again. Two keyboard, two two pianos. No, no, no. The Roland Haynes played the bass. He actually, he was actually a bass player. He was, wasn't he? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. and he also played the piano. So that's why we did the double piano thing. But, uh... I don't know, he played the piano like he played the piano like I, you know. And uh, it was his date, and he just decided to do that. So that was okay. Uh, but he was actually the bass player with uh, O.C. Smith and me and, uh, oh, uh, Louis Large and... Yeah, no, Archie Shep, man. I met, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I I saw Roland Haynes on playing upright bass on on this uh, uh, the Attica a- a- album that Archie Shep did. I said that's not the same cat that was on Second Coming, but it was. Oh yeah. Holy uh, cow! I don't know where he is now. If you find that, I hope you tell me. Uh, please tell me. You, you I, I didn't want to get in touch with him. Oh, you know, I've been bugging the skipper about it. Yeah, Lightsy, listen, Sunship, tell me a great... Well, how how magical a force was that cat? Sunship. Yeah. <laughs> Sunship, when, when, my, when the introduction to my show, I give homage to four people. On a mission given to me by Woody Shaw, Dizzy, and Sunship. I mean, Sunship okay. is in, in my soul pushing me forward, so the idea that you guys... 